folks in. All right. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to wait just a second here to let everyone get admitted. Um, uh, okay, sorry. So, so what did you mute? Uh, thank you so much for joining today. I'm Vanessa with the Dallas Public Library. Uh, just a few housekeeping things for today. Um, you will be muted and have your video turned off. Um, this program will be recorded, uh, just so you know that. And if you have any questions, um, you can put them in the chat and uh, someone from the zoo will be monitoring that chat as well. And so um, they'll get to those questions in between animals and also have time for questions at the end. Uh, like I said, I'm with the Dallas Public Library and we do this program series of Earth Day every day in conjunction with the um, Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. So thank you so much to them for partnering us on this program. And the zoo's gonna talk a little bit about animals today and how they interact with our environment. And we're super excited uh, uh, today and be sure that you go out and the zoo is open. Uh, I do believe uh, they'll probably cover this, but you'll have to um, get tickets in advance, I think still, but I'll let them cover all of that. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over uh, to the zoo and um, we get to meet some animals today. Thank you so much. Awesome, well, thank you so much for tuning in today. We are so excited to be here with you. My name is Jess, tuning in to you live from the Dallas Zoo. Now, as you mentioned, we are still open. We do have some new safety measures in place. So we are taking some extra precautions to ensure that our guests have a safe and exciting experience here. Um, and yes, the tickets are uh, still, we do ask them that they are purchased in advance. So you can go ahead and get those on our website. But you don't have to go and get a ticket for this today because we're bringing a little bit of the zoo to you. I didn't come alone today. I not only brought some colleagues, but we brought seven different animals with us today. We brought birds, mammals, and even reptiles that can be found all over the world. Now, each of these animals was actually born under human care, either here at the Dallas Zoo or at another zoo. But they're excellent ambassadors for their cousins that can be found all over the world. Now we heard today that you guys are celebrating Earth Day every day and we chose a special group of animals that each have a really great conservation message that you can help the Dallas Zoo with. So we're going to show you some animals and tell you how you can help us create a better world for animals. Now your host did mention that you're going to have the chance to ask some questions. We're going to ask you guys to type those questions into the chat box. Ryan is behind the scenes on the computer and we'll be monitoring that chat box and we will have time to answer those questions after each animal and we will allot about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the program to answer any questions that we didn't get to. And just one more little logistical thing, we are going to be switching back and forth between cameras. I do have Shannon and Alyssa behind the scenes who are gonna be handling our animals as well as handling that secondary camera to give you guys an up close view of those animals. All right, you guys, looks like the first little guy is ready to come out and meet you. We're gonna actually start our journey today out in Africa and we're going to meet the most sharply dressed animal on our animal adventures team. His name is Chamalsi, and he is an African crested porcupine. Now, Chamalsi is a name that means young and proud, and I think Chamalsi has quite a bit to be proud of. This is not only the largest rodent species in Africa, but he's actually the largest species of porcupine in the world. Now, as a porcupine, I mentioned he is sharply dressed. He is equipped with thousands of needle sharp quills all over his body. Now, out in Africa, Chamalsi here has a lot of predators to worry about. Africa has the highest density of predators in the world. So Chamalsi, as a small animal, needs a way to protect himself. And he does so by being covered in his own natural built-in weapon system. So on his back, he has thousands of needle sharp quills. Now, oftentimes we're asked if we feel a little bit in danger when we're working around Chamalsi. One of the most common questions that I receive here at the zoo is if we're worried about Chamalsi shooting his quills out at us. Well, Chamalsi's quills here are actually a type of hair. It's a type of modified hair. So he can shoot those quills out of his body about as well as we can shoot the hair out of our heads. So not at all. That is just an animal myth. However, even though he cannot shoot those quills, it's still one of the most amazing and effective adaptations for defense in the animal kingdom. 
Not only does he have a couple, actually about tens of thousands of those quills all over his body, but they're very, very long. You can see some of those quills are around 14 inches in length. Now we can tell Chamosi is feeling pretty comfortable right now because those quills are laying down flat. However, if Chamosi were to get excited or alarmed, he has the ability to make those quills stand up. What happens is he gets lots of goosebumps all over his body. And just like the goosebumps on our, uh, on our arms make the hair on our arms stand up, the goosebumps on his body make his quills stand straight up too. And when he does that, he makes himself look quite a bit bigger. With 14 inch long quills on his back, he can increase his size by a lot, making it appear that he might be a little bit too big for predators to go after. He also flashes those special colors. If you look closely at his quills, you'll notice that there's a lot of black and white stripes on them. Now, Chamalsi here is a nocturnal animal. He's awake at nighttime. And a lot of nocturnal animals don't see colors like you and I do. Instead of having a lot of cones in their eyes to view colors, they have a lot of extra rods in their eyes so that they can see better in lower light conditions. So they traded color vision for a more gray, black and white um, type vision to see better at night. So Chamalsi has these stripes all over his quills to act as a warning color system. Instead of having reds and oranges and yellows like other animals' warning colors, he has black and white stripes. A lot of animals have black and white stripes on their bodies um, to warn their predators that they're dangerous. Let's take the skunk, for instance. Skunks have those black and white stripes on their back that actually point to their rear, which is where they uh, shoot out um, their stink. And Chamalsi here has those black and white stripes all over his quills to advertise that the quills are dangerous. It's a type of coloration that we call aposomatic coloration. Even our porcupines here in Texas have black and white stripes on their quills. Their quills are quite a bit smaller and often hidden under fur, but they have those same stripes on their quills to advertise that they're dangerous. But they cannot shoot those quills. Predators actually have to make contact with those quills for them to do any damage. But luckily for Chamalsi, he has the ability to move very quickly. So in the event that a predator were to approach him, he would get those goosebumps all over his body and those quills would stand straight up. And he actually has the ability to run backwards almost as quickly as he runs forward, helping him to make contact with that predator who's coming after him. But oftentimes predators won't even want to approach them in the first place. Not only does he have that warning color system, but he also has the ability to make a sound that's rather scary. On uh, the rear of Chamalsi here, he has quills that are actually hollow. And he has the ability to shake these quills. If he vibrates his body, those quills will actually vibrate together, making almost a hissing type sound. And in the animal world, a hiss is sort of a universal um, sound for danger. So he's able to not only ward off predators with his appearance by having those quills with those special stripes, but he could even make a warning sound. So those quills of his are effective enough that there aren't many predators that actually like to hunt porcupines. In fact, porcupines all over the world, the um, number one cause of death for them is often old age. Porcupines are so good at defending themselves with their quills that oftentimes uh, predators don't hunt them at all. Usually what happens is that they get, uh, they get old, they're not eating as much, and their teeth continue to grow. So as a rodent, his teeth continue to grow throughout his life, and he needs to constantly be chewing on things to grind them down. So as they get older and they uh, aren't eating quite as much, their teeth do have a tendency to get overgrown. And that is typically what does porcupines in, in their natural habitat. Uh, because they're so good at defending themselves, they are one of the only animals out in nature that actually typically just die from old age because their defense system is that good. Now we don't have any porcupine, we don't have the uh, African crested porcupine here in Texas, but we do have many porcupines as well as other backyard animals that call Texas home. And there are a couple of very simple things that you and I can do in our own homes to help take care of our backyard visitors, just like the porcupines, the skunks, and the opossums. And that's as simple as just cleaning up the trash in your yard. If we keep our yards clean, we're less likely to attract wildlife to eat things that might make themselves really sick. 
Oftentimes, opossums are, and raccoons are common residents in our neighborhoods. And if they eat things like um, candy wrappers or chocolate, it can make them very, very sick. So if we're a little bit more vigilant about the cleanliness of our front yards, we can help to create better neighborhoods for our local animals. And they can help us out by eating things like ticks and fleas and um, helping to keep the spread of disease by taking care of things like rats and mice for us. So just keep your yards nice and clean and you can help create a better neighborhood for your backyard animals. All right, you guys, we're gonna stay in Africa, but we're gonna move on down to the coast, uh, the southern coast of Africa next. And we're gonna be meeting the best dressed bird here at the Dallas Zoo. Now this is a bird that traded it, its ability to fly to um, have a better ability to swim. This is Donnie here, and Donnie is an African black-footed penguin. Now you heard me right, I said African penguin. One of the common myths about penguins is that they only live where it's cold. Now there are about 18 different species of penguins in the world, and only around five or so actually live or migrate to cold regions. One of the other myths about them is that they can be found in the north with polar bears. Oftentimes at Christmas time, we see those Coca-Cola ads with, those, uh, with the polar bears and the penguins hanging out, but actually all penguins live in the southern hemisphere. Polar bears live in the north, so you'll never see them together out in their natural habitat. And oftentimes you won't see penguins in cold areas at all because the majority of them prefer warm weather. The African penguin, for instance, prefers beaches uh, in Southern Africa that can reach temperatures of over 100 degrees in the summertime. So Donnie here feels right at home in the heat of Texas. In fact, he's even got his sandals on. He's got naked feet to help keep him nice and cool during this toasty Texas weather. Other penguins prefer warm places like the Galapagos Islands, uh, New Zealand, South America, places where they can stay nice and warm in the sun. But Donnie here lives on those rocky beaches of South Africa. And as a penguin, he spends a great deal of time in the water. I briefly mentioned that penguins traded their ability to fly to gain an ability to swim. And that's because their food actually prefers to hang out in the water itself. Penguins are a piscivore, meaning that they like to eat fish. Now, the majority of their diet is things like small schooling fish, anchovies, capelin, but they will occasionally eat something like a jelly or even a squid. But to be a good fish hunter, he needs to be an excellent swimmer. And fortunately for Donnie here, he's adapted from his head all the way down to his toes for a lifestyle spent chasing very quick fish in the water. If you take a look at those feet again, he's got flippers. He's built, he's got feet just like a duck, helping him to paddle and steer through the water. Instead of wings to fly, he traded those in for fins to help him to glide through the water. And he's got a body that's hydrodynamic. It's built for gliding through the water with very little drag. His body's shaped like a bullet. It tapers at the front and tapers down at the end, allowing the water to glide very smoothly over his tiny body. Now that all works together to give him a very quick swim. He can actually swim over 10 miles per hour. Now that might not seem very fast to us, but if you were watching the Olympics lately uh, and you actually were watching some of those swimming competitions, those gold medalists were actually only swimming between four and five miles per hour. Now those guys are typically around six feet tall. Donnie here is just a little bit over a foot tall, around two feet when he stretches himself out. And the two foot bird can easily double the speed of an Olympic swimmer because his body is built for exactly that. And if you take a close look at his body, he is covered in feathers. He is a bird, birds are covered in feathers, but his feathers are actually specialized for swimming instead of flight. His feathers are actually very, very small and they sit tightly against his body. And it actually, if you take a look at the base of his tail, you might even get to see some of those little downy feathers underneath. Now he's got those stiff, slick feathers on the outside of his body to kind of act as a wetsuit. They're actually waterproof. He puts a, um, he has a little gland at the base of his tail that excretes an oil that he uses sort of as a conditioner and a water repellent. He puts that all over his feathers to make, him, make them waterproof. And then underneath those feathers, he's got those really fluffy downy feathers to help keep him warm. 
So those feathers work together to keep his skin dry and warm as he's swimming in that icy ocean water after his food. These birds can dive to really deep depths. And the, when you get deeper in the ocean, the water gets quite a bit colder. So he's got those feathers that help keep him toasty warm at just about any depth that he needs to go in that ocean. So this is an animal that is perfectly built for a life spent largely in the water. However, this is an animal that does need our, uh, need our help. He is actually an endangered species. We've lost over 99% of this species over just the last 100 years. And that is actually because their nesting uh, spot has a resource that people really like to use. So instead of building a, a nest out of sticks like a lot of other birds do, they actually prefer to make their nest in their own guano. Now that might sound a little bit gross, but these birds can eat about half of their body weight in fish every day, which means that they do create a lot of waste. Now over time, as they're doing their business out on those beaches, that guano builds up very tall and it turns into almost like a clay. And it's the perfect type of soil for them to dig down into to build a burrow. Out on those rocky beaches, they're not worried about keeping their eggs warm. They're worried about, or they're worried about keeping their eggs cool and keeping them from drying out. So that guano is the perfect area for them to keep their eggs at the correct temperature and humidity. But if you guys are gardeners, you might know that guano can make an excellent fertilizer. And a guano from a fish eating animal can be an extra good fertilizer. So what's happened is that their guano has been mined faster than they've been able to replace it. And so without places for them to lay their eggs, there are fewer penguins making it to adulthood or even hatching in the first place. So over this past um, just 100 years, we've lost over 99% of this, these birds, largely due to that. But there is a lot of hope for these penguins and it's because of support from people like you that they do have uh, this little glimmer of hope in their future. So the Dallas Zoo's got a really smart guy. He's our associate, assistant curator of birds and ectotherms. He actually designed an artificial nesting igloo that mimics the same temperature and humidity as their natural guano nests. Now he worked together with some other AZA accredited zoos and they actually raised enough money to install several thousand of these nests across the penguins beaches in Africa. And some of our staff have even gotten to accompany him out there to help install some of these nests. And these penguins were so desperate for places to nest that they actually utilized these, um, these igloos within their first year. So what happened is about 90% uh, of these igloos in that first season they were installed, they actually had penguins inside of them. And around 60% of those nests that had penguins inside of them actually fledged young penguins. So just by uh, booking programs like this and visiting the zoo, you guys are all helping the Dallas Zoo to create a better world for animals with avenues like this. The Dallas Zoo is a nonprofit zoo, which means that each time you visit or support us, a portion of every dollar goes directly to conservation programs just like this. So just by supporting your Dallas Zoo, you are already celebrating Earth Day every day and helping us to create a better world for animals. Now, I did see we had some questions pop up. Vanessa oh, wants to go back to the porcupine. She wants to know, do they naturally shed their quills since they are a type of hair? Yes, they do. So just like we shed hair out of our heads every day and um, dogs shed hair out of their, um, their bodies um, throughout the year, yes, our, pain, our porcupine does shed his quills. And just like our hair, each time he sheds a quill, a new one grows back. And there are certain times of the year where he does shed more quills um, than others. So in the summertime, Jamalsi will often lose sometimes um, between uh, 10 to 12 quills every single day, and they all grow back. Great question. JRS wants to know, does Donnie the penguin eat anything besides fish? No, Donnie really does prefer to just eat fish here at the zoo. So his favorite fish include things like smelt uh, and capelin. So he actually likes to eat the same kind of fish that um, sushi restaurants put um, into sushi. Those little eggs that are on the outside of sushi rolls are actually the kind of um, smelt fish uh, that uh, Donnie likes to eat. And sometimes he likes to enjoy some herring as well. But here at the Dallas Zoo, he really does prefer to eat just fish. 
JRS also wanted to point out that everyone can make a difference, that each little impact we all make every day really adds up to make a difference to the environment. So they're pointing that out. That's right. All right, you guys, we're going to stay in Africa, but we are going to travel to a little island off of the coast of Africa that you may have heard of before. It's called Madagascar. Now, if you guys have hung out with your grandkids and watched that movie Madagascar, you might know that it's the island that has those lemurs that like to move it, move it. Well, we're going to meet a reptile from that island who likes to do a little bit of moving herself. On her way out, we've got Tana, and Tana here is a radiated tortoise. Now, sometimes when scientists give animals names, they're not super creative with them. They often give them names that kind of highlight some feature on their body. And in Tana's case, she gets the name radiated tortoise because of that beautiful shell of hers. If you take a close look at it, it almost looks like she's got little rays of sunshine radiating down that shell of hers, hence the name radiated tortoise. Now, speaking of that shell, it's a really important feature for her. As a tortoise, she's got a lot of things that she, a lot of predators that she may have to worry about. A lot of animals will eat things like turtles and tortoises. So they've got that natural, that shell built in on their body to kind of act as a natural helmet. It helps to protect them from things that might fall on them as they're traveling around or things that might want to hunt them. Now that shell is part of her body. She cannot come out of it. It's actually made out of the same stuff as our hair and our fingernails are. And that same stuff that those quills that porcupine had are. If you take a close look at it, it's made out of this stuff called keratin. Keratin is a type of protein that's found in a variety of things in the animal world. Our uh, keratin is what our hair is made out of, our fingernails, fingernails are made out of, bird beaks and bird feathers are made out of keratin as well. But that keratin on her is just very a very hard version of that. And as she grows, that shell continues to grow more keratin inside of it. If you take a close look at the way that it's shaped, you'll notice that there's little rings in her shell. So as she grows, she grows a new layer of keratin. So as she, as she grows larger, her shell not only grows larger in size with her, but it even grows thicker, helping, it to, make, helping to make it an even better protector for her as she grows, as she grows in size. But a lot of scientists think that that's probably not how turtles and tortoises come, or why turtles and tortoises got their shells. There's actually some new research that suggests that turtles and tortoises actually got their shells to help them to dig. Now, all turtles and tortoises will dig at some point in their life, either to deposit eggs out on a beach like those sea turtles, or to dig themselves a burrow for shelter. Now, by having that shell that's built in, they've kind of got a natural built-in back brace. So their backbone is actually embedded in their shell. And that shell is actually uh, made of bone underneath that keratin layer. And it's actually modified ribs. So by having that natural back brace built in on their back, they're actually helping to prevent strain on their back as they're digging. It's kind of like wearing a back brace can sometimes help you as you're digging a lot of holes in your garden to plant things. Or uh, wearing a back brace as you're lifting weights at the gym. So it not only prevents strain on their back, but it also helps to give them a little bit more strength as they're digging in tough, uh, in tough conditions. Sometimes the soil that they're digging in is really compacted and hard. And by having that natural built-in back brace, it actually helps to give them a little bit more strength as they're digging with their feet. So that shell of theirs is an incredibly important adaptation, not only for protection, but to also help them to dig, to find food, to um, find shelter, and to find a safe place to deposit their eggs. Now, Tana here, I see, how old is she? She is about 14 years old. And this is actually very young for a tortoise. So the radiated tortoise can actually live somewhere around 100 years under ideal conditions. Now, it's really hard to approach a tortoise out in its natural habitat and know how old they are. In fact, the only way to know for sure how old a tortoise is, is to know when it hatched and how long it's been around for. And the oldest radiated tortoise that we know of lived until about 180 years old. So they do live quite a long time. 
Now talking about going back to that shell, that shell is actually something that can get the radiated tortoise into a little bit of trouble. So the radiated tortoise is a critically endangered species and that is largely due to the illegal wildlife trade. Because their shell is so beautiful, they're actually very lucrative on the black market. This tortoise is very commonly poached from their natural habitat to be sold as things like pets, or as decoration or even medicine. So this tortoise has actually suffered a very huge decline in population because of the illegal wildlife trade. But again, just by supporting the Dallas Zoo, you are helping to create hope for this species. Just a few years back, there was a house out in Madagascar that was discovered with 10,000 of these tortoises inside of it, getting ready to be shipped out all over the world. Now, as you can imagine, a home with uh, one single home with 10,000 tortoises inside of it, they weren't really doing that well. A lot of them were sick and uh, injured and on the brink of death. Now, luckily for these tortoises, the local Turtle Survival Alliance discovered this. A, a tip was brought in by a local to let them know that these tortoises were in need of help. And the Turtle Survival Alliance reached out to zoos all over the world for some help. And the Dallas Zoo, fortunately, was able to assist with that. We were able to send out not only um, our herpetologist staff, but we were able to send out veterinary um, vet staff vet techs, and even medical supplies to help nurse these tortoises back to health with hopes of releasing them back into their natural habitat. So again, thank you for supporting the Dallas Zoo. Your visit uh, and your support in ways like this really do make a difference for animals all over the world. Now, did we have any other questions about our radiated tortoise? We had one person, Christopher, asking about the pyramiding on her uh, carapace and if that impacts her backbone. So she doesn't really have um, that. Uh, she doesn't really have that much pyramiding, but yes, that is a good observation. Sometimes severe pyramiding in the shell can actually be a sign of what's called metabolic bone disease. So sometimes if tortoises don't receive proper lighting or they don't receive proper nutrition, they can get severe pyramiding in their shell. However, uh, she doesn't really, this is a species that naturally has small peaks inside of their shell, so she doesn't have that issue. However, you do very commonly see um, pet tortoises that do have severe deformities in their shell. And yes, if they don't receive the proper lighting or the proper nutrition or the proper housing, it can cause extreme deformities in their shell. This can cause things like um, spinal, um, uh, spinal fusion. It can cause things like um, um, the spine to be growing at different kinks. It can cause a lot of skeletal problems. So that is actually something to really think about in the event that you consider bringing an animal like a tortoise into your home as a pet. Um, oftentimes we see tortoises in, inter in internet videos and um, on TV, and they might appear to make um, a pet that would be really interesting to have in our home. However, they do have a lot of additional responsibilities that other pets like cats and dogs do not. They require special housing, special food, and special lights that can actually cost around $70 a piece that need to be replaced every six months. So they do require a lot of additional things to make sure that they stay healthy throughout their entire life. And then you have the added um, responsibility of taking care of them for a very long time. I mentioned the radiated tortoise here, the oldest one we know of, lived to about 180 years. Those little sulcata tortoises that start out this big at the, pet, at the pet store can actually live around 200 years and get to be over 200 pounds at their adult size. So yes, um, the pyramiding can impact their body. So it is very important to make sure that these animals have the correct in things in their environment to make sure that they grow properly. Really good question. That's all the questions we have. All right. Well, we're going to stay in Africa, but we're going to go back over to the bird world. And this is one that's going to do a little bit of flying for you today. She's already eager to come on in, so we're going to send her in. Her name is Ella. And Ella here is a type of bird called a trumpeter hornbill. Now, if you've seen the movie The Lion King before, you've seen the cartoon version of the hornbill. Uh, so hornbill is a very common type of bird found out in Africa. Now, Disney did take some liberties when they were designing Zazu, the, uh, the uh, hornbill. Um, they typically aren't that blue in color, and they don't typically have that bright orange beak. They usually look a little bit more like Ella here. Now, Ella here is called a hornbill because of that beautiful beak of hers. It's shaped a little bit like a cow's horn. 
And she's called a trumpeter hornbill because of the sound that she makes. Now in the movie, Zazu was sort of the messenger for the lions. His job was to bring in the morning report and do a lot of talking. And Disney actually didn't take too many liberties with that. This is actually the role that hornbills play in Africa. So the trumpeter hornbill itself actually lives out in the jungles of Africa. And its job is to actually be a sort of alarm system for, its, uh, for the other animals in their habitat. The trumpeter hornbill has a, has a um, vocalization that sounds a lot like a trumpet and it's very loud. And if they see something that's interesting or startling, they actually start to make a lot of noise. Ella herself is pretty chatty, so if you do listen kind of closely, you might be able to hear her make a little bit of sound as she's flying back and forth uh, from Cam's arm. Now, the reason that they're able to make those really loud sounds is largely due to that specialized beak of theirs. Now, don't worry, her beak is not broken. That bump is actually supposed to look like that. That bump on the top of her beak is called the cask, and it's function, scientists think, is to help amplify her voice. So that cask of hers is actually hollow on the inside of it. So when she makes noise, it actually reverberates inside of that, uh, inside of that hollow chamber. So just like an acoustic guitar is hollow to amplify the sound of the strings, that cast on the top of her beak is hollow to amplify the sound of her voice, allowing her to call farther and through more brush in the forest. Now, being in the forest herself, she does have some challenges herself. You'll see she's eating a little bit of fruit right now on Cam's arm, but this is an animal that's also largely an insectivore. They will eat a lot of fruits and flowers and um, other vegetation in the forest, but some of their favorite things to eat are things like dragonflies. And to be a dragonfly hunter, she needs to be an excellent flyer. But out in those jungles where she lives, she's got a lot of obstacles to avoid. So luckily for her, her body is built for flight inside of a very close area. If you pay close attention to her wings, you'll notice that they're actually pretty short for a bird her size. If she had long, broad wings like a hawk or a vulture, she would be hitting a lot of branches and vines and shrubs as she was flying. So instead of those, Ella here has short, rounded wings that allow her to fit through tiny openings in her forest habitat. And she's got a long tail to help her to steer. If you notice, she actually move it a little bit back and forth as she's um, turning to land. And when she's ready to land, she'll flare that tail out big to act as a braking system to help her slow down before making her graceful landing. A lot of birds that live in forests have this body shape. If any of you all are bird watchers and have been out into some of our forested parks here in Texas, you may have seen a Cooper's hawk. Cooper's hawks actually have a similar body shape, short rounded wings and a long tail to help them fit through tiny openings and steer as they're hunting in their forested habitat. So this is an example of an animal who has a specific form for a specific function. Now, uh, one of her other functions that she has that's actually one of my very favorite things is being a very good parent. So oftentimes in the animal world, it's sort of just mom that's in the picture, but not in the trumpeter hornbill world. So in the trumpeter hornbill world, mom and dad actually share pretty equal responsibility raising the young. So they do build a nest that is um, like other birds, but they actually prefer to build their nest inside the hollow part of a trunk of a tree. Now what they do is they seal up mom and the eggs and the babies inside that hollow trunk of the tree. There's only a hole about this big um, where mom and babies can see through. Now mom can't go out and hunt for the babies at this point, she's stuck in the nest with the young. So dad actually goes out each and every day and gets food and brings it back to mom and babies. And then when mom and babies make a big mess inside of the nest, they pass all of the waste through that tiny hole so that dad can basically take out the trash, helping to keep uh, the babies clean and healthy. So they actually work really well together to raise their young. And by doing this, they protect their youngsters from predators like snakes that might want to make an easy meal out of a young hornbill. So this is a really ex excellent example of co-parenting in the animal world. Now, I did see we had quite a few questions pop up about Ella. 
Yes. Yeah, so people want to know um, if the hornbills are born with such big bills or if it develops over time. So it does develop over time. So that beak is something that actually continues to grow throughout their life. It's made out of the same stuff as our fingernails. It's made out of keratin and it actually continues to grow um, throughout their entire life. Now out in their natural habitat and here at the zoo, they eat a lot of foods and we have special um, features in their environment so that they can actually naturally file down their beak. But when they're born, their beak is shaped a little bit differently. I would imagine it would be pretty tough to fit inside of an egg with a giant beak on the front of their face. So it is a little bit different um, when they're first hatched, but it does grow very quickly. Actually, oftentimes bird gro birds grow to the size of their parents in, within about 30 to 45 days. So they do grow very, very quickly. We also had a question if all species of hornbill do this, where they nest inside a tree and seal it up, all but two hornbills nest inside of trees uh, um, that seal that they seal up. Yep, so it is a very common behavior in these birds in order to protect their youngsters from predators. All right, well, we're gonna go ahead and move on. We're finally gonna hop in the plane and go down to Central and South America to meet another mammal. Now, I'm sure you know that mammals are all covered in hair, but this animal actually has a special type of hair covering her body. It's a little bit harder and it's pretty protective but it's not quite like the porcupines. On her way out, we've got Titan, and Titan here is the three-banded armadillo. So this is the smaller cousin of our nine-banded armadillo here in Texas. Cam's showing you how she gets her name. Instead of having nine to 12 bands on their back, she's got three bands on her back. Now, speaking of that back, that's that hair that I was talking about. So armadillos have a, type, have a modified hair on their back that creates an armor. Again, it's made out of that same keratin stuff. It's just a harder form of it to help keep them protected. Now she's showing her primary defense off right now. The three-banded armadillo is the only type of armadillo in the world that has the ability to curl up into a ball for protection. Now don't worry about Titan. She doesn't feel the need to protect herself right now. She's actually just 19 years old. So they not only curl themselves up into a ball for protection, but they curl themselves up into a ball to sleep as well. And that is probably what Titan is doing as a 19 year old armadillo. Out in their natural habitat, uh, they, don't even, uh, they don't usually even live to 19 years old. So she's a senior citizen here at the Dallas Zoo who gets quite a bit of sleep. But she's showing off that amazing ability to defend herself. So down in Central and South America, she's got a lot of predators to worry about. Things like large birds of prey, um, jaguars, all sorts of things that would want to turn a tiny animal like her into a meal. So she's covered from head to toe in that hard keratin armor to protect herself. And she can actually fold that, her body up into a ball so perfectly that no soft part is exposed. If Cam picks her up right now, you can actually see how her head and her tail are also armored and fit together like a puzzle piece to keep herself completely protected. But if that's not enough, she actually has another way to defend herself. And that's actually by creating a little bit of a trap. Now, sometimes when these animals are sleeping, they'll sleep with a little bit of a gap in their shell. And this is sort of like a natural built-in mousetrap mechanism. So what happens is that they've got tiny hairs on their belly that are kind of like whiskers. They're sensory hairs that allow her to feel what's going on. So if some kind of predator gets a little bit curious and comes over and pokes at that little gap she leaves in her shell, she'll feel it with those hairs. And her instinct is to snap shut very hard and very quickly. Now, Cam here is being very, very careful to not put her fingers anywhere near Titan's belly, because if Titan were to snap shut on Cam's fingers, she can do so with enough force to actually snap uh, Cam's finger and break the bone. And she can actually hold herself closed for several hours. So she can actually defend herself by teaching those predators a lesson. They wouldn't want to hunt an armadillo after having a toe um, or toe or a nose um, get snapped shut on. So she protects herself not only with that armor, but with that ama the amazing set of abs as well. But Titan here is also a bit of a predator herself. You'll notice she's eating some worms at the moment. Titan here is largely an insectivore, meaning she likes to eat a lot of the creepy crawly things found on the ground in her habitat. 
Now you can't see too many of them right now, but she's got adaptations from her head all the way down to her toes to help her hunt her food of choice. She's got a long pointy nose that she can use to snip several inches down into the dirt for her food. She's also got long claws built in on her legs that act as natural shovels to help her quickly burrow down into the dirt in pursuit of her prey. So she's got adaptations not only for defense, but adaptations to help her hunt her food as well. So Titan is an excellent example of an animal that is covered in all sorts of adaptations to make it through the day. Now here in Texas, we don't have the three-banded armadillo, but we do have the uh, nine-banded armadillo. And this is another animal that will sometimes make their way into our own backyards. Now, sometimes these animals can get themselves into trouble, again, by eating things that they're not supposed to. Now, I mentioned that we can help create a better world for animals by cleaning up some of the trash in our yards, but we can help create a better world for animals by not even creating that trash in the first place. Just by trying to reuse and recycle things, um, we can help reduce the amount of waste being introduced into our local habitats. Just by doing something simple, like using reusable bags at the store when you're grocery shopping or using reusable straws at a restaurant or um, in the drive-through while you're getting coffee, we can help reduce the amount of plastics that are being introduced into our habitats here in Texas. We actually just celebrated Plastic Free July here at the zoo where we take a pledge um, to help reduce uh, our plastic use um, as individuals to help make a positive impact on animals. So just as our friend mentioned earlier, tiny steps each and every day, as simple as using a reusable bag at the grocery store can help create a better world for animals, not only in our neighborhoods, but all over the world. Now, did we have any questions about Titan? No, we didn't. All right, well, we're gonna move on and we're gonna meet another reptile found down in South America. He's probably one of my favorites here at the zoo. I'm a little bit biased. His name is Spock and Spock here is an Argentinian black and white tegu. Now he is another animal with a very descriptive name. He's called an Argentinian tegu because of where he's from. They're found down near the Argentina area of South America. However, they don't know political borders, so they're found a little bit beyond that, but he's called a black and white tegu because of his beautiful colors. And again, those colors are an indicator of what time he is awake. Spock is largely a nocturnal animal, so he does have that black and white coloration, in his case, not so much for warning colors, but to help him blend in with his environment. Spock here is largely a predator, so he needs to be able to camouflage himself, not only to hide from his prey, but hide from predators of his own. So he's got black and white coloration uh, spots all over his body to help him blend in with the shadows. As the moon shines uh, through things like trees and grass, he can blend in with those shadows created. Now Spock here, he's taking a little bit of a nap right now, but if he decides to wake up, you'll notice he's, uh, he starts to do something with his mouth. Spock here will start flicking his tongue, maybe at any moment, he might not. But Spock here, I mentioned, is a bit of a predator. Many predators rely on a pretty good sense of, uh, of eyesight to find their prey or hearing, but Spock here actually relies heavily on a sense of smell to locate his prey. And by flicking that tongue of his, he's showing off how he does that. So Spock actually smells with his mouth instead of his nose. So what he does is he sticks that tongue out just like he's doing right now and he waves it all around. And when he waves that tongue around, he's picking up all kinds of scent particles on the air. Then he sticks that tongue back inside of his mouth and sticks it up to the roof of his mouth. And on the roof of his mouth is something called the Jacobson's organ, which is basically like a supercomputer for smell. It can actually smell about a thousand times better than our noses can, helping him to detect even the faintest of scents as he's looking for his food. Now he likes to eat all kinds of different things. He is an omnivore, so he will eat things like fruits and vegetables, but as an adult tegu, they are largely carnivorous, eating things like rats and mice, other smaller reptiles, perhaps even something like a fish. Now it's important for Spock here to keep himself uh, nice and satiated because he needs to keep that face big and beautiful. I'm sure one of the first things you noticed about Spock are those big, beautiful cheeks of his. Now, those cheeks are actually how we know that Spock is a boy. So in the Tegu world, they do have dimorphism, two different shapes, uh, so that you can tell the difference between the boys and the girls. 
The boys have those big fat cheeks and the girls have slender faces. Now those big cheeks of his are actually how Spock potentially attracts a mate. So those cheeks of his are full of fat and that's the reason that he needs to eat a lot of food. By having those big fat cheeks on his face, he's able to advertise to the lady tegus out there that he is a very good hunter. He's got the genetics and the behaviors that he needs in order to find lots of food. So by being a good looking tegu like that, he would potentially be a good mate for them to choose. You would want to have babies from a tegu that had big cheeks like that. All right, I didn't see any questions about Spock, but we're getting short on time because I don't know how to stop talking. So we'll go ahead and move on to our final animal of the day. I'm very excited to share this one with you. We're finally gonna travel on up uh, to uh, here in Texas, actually the Southern uh, Southwestern deserts of the United States. And we're going to be meeting a raptor this time. He'll be flying on in here in just a moment. He's waiting a little bit, um, but we'll ruin the surprise here. We're going to be meeting a Harris's hawk. And Harris's hawks are a type of hawk that live down in the southwestern deserts of the U.S. Here he go. Here he comes. He's coming right on in. So Harris's hawks are a type of hawk that we can find right here uh, in Texas, not so much in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but over um, with our friends in the western part of Texas. Now this is an animal that is an obligate carnivore. It makes its living by hunting, but hunting in a pretty harsh area. The southwestern deserts as well as the, the deserts in Central America can be very difficult places to find food. These birds have to be able to take advantage of absolutely any food that they can find. They'll hunt things like small rodents, um, they'll hunt snakes as well as other reptiles, but oftentimes they don't really have much of a choice. They have to take advantage of just about anything they can find. And one of the most common animals down in the southwestern deserts are jackrabbits. Now, Tonkawa here is a pretty big bird, but he only weighs about 700 grams. That's about a pound and a half. Now, some of those jackrabbits can weigh over 10 pounds. Now, how on earth would a pound and a half bird take down a jackrabbit that can be upwards of 10 times its size? Well, it actually does so with a little bit of help from its friends. So Harris's hawks are a pretty unique raptor in that they're social birds. Many raptors actually prefer to spend their time alone. They're solitary except for the mating season, but not the Harris's hawk. Harris's hawks are known to spend time, spend time in groups from anywhere from two to even 10 individuals. Now these are typically family groups, but they do everything together. They perch together, they hunt together, they even help the matriarch nest. So the, um, the, the, the female hawk who is dominant is the only one that lays, uh, that lays eggs, but the other Harris's hawks will even help her raise her youngsters. So they actually work together. Sometimes they get the nickname, the wolves of the sky because they're known to hunt cooperatively. Now, the way that they take down those jackrabbits is by running out all of their energy. So they basically play a game of leapfrog. One individual flushes that, flushes that uh, jackrabbit out of a bush or out from under a rock and it starts to run. And what they do is they take turns chasing that jackrabbit. So they, um, one chases it until it gets tired and then the other one comes in. And what they do is they keep trading um, off the duty of chasing this rabbit until the rabbit's energy is gone. And the largest female is able to come in and actually take it down. So by working together as a team, these birds are actually able to take down prey that is larger than them. That's not something that's very common in the raptor world. Now, because this animal is a social one, they're also a very uh, common bird in the sport of falconry. Now, if you're not familiar with falconry, it is the sport of utilizing birds of prey to hunt. And falconers are actually helping us grow our food in a way that's more sustainable for wildlife. Now, I do have many friends who are falconers, and one of the ways that they hunt with their birds is by going out to places like vineyards and farms. So what they do is they go out with their, with their birds, and they actually help the farmers control their pests. 
Many raptors' favorite foods are things like rats and mice or birds that like to eat things, uh, the, the foods that we grow. And by bringing their raptors out to places like vineyards and farms, they're helping to scare off pest animals. Simply by flying their birds over a vineyard or over um, a plot of crops, they're able to scare away prey animals. Prey animals don't want to eat food in an area that's risky to be in. So one of the simple ways that you can help create a better world for animals is actually just by supporting local farms and vineyards that utilize natural pest control methods like this in order to take care um, of, of pests. So by reducing the use of things like chemicals, they're introducing fewer of those chemicals into the environment where they can harm animals besides their intended target. In fact, many rodenticides are actually very harmful for things like um, things like coyotes and foxes and birds of prey. Because those mice eat that poison, uh, it stays in their system. And if some, they get eaten by something like an owl or a hawk or a fox, that fox or owl or hawk also gets poisoned themselves. So by utilizing things like falconers or by introducing predators onto their property and setting them up with habitat, some farms and ranches are reducing their dependence on chemical pest control methods, not only helping themselves by having um, another form of pest control, but also helping wildlife by giving them a healthier and healthy environment to live in. So another very simple thing you can do is just go out to your local farmer's market and get chatting with the farmers and see what sorts of methods that they use to control pests and support those ones that uh, utilize um, pest control methods that use fewer chemicals. Now I see we did have one more question about the hawk. Was the noise the hawk making its way of asking for more treats? So uh, yes, uh, Harris's hawks are known for being very vocal birds. Because they live in large groups together, they do make a lot of vocalizations um, to uh, communicate with each other. And yes, Tonkawa does use a lot of vocalizing in order to, um, in order to, let us know what it is that he wants. So yes, he was very excited to be here and he was making a little bit of noise because he was kind of anticipating something happening. Yes. All right, I don't believe we have any more questions, but we did have a few reminders. Oh, we did have one question after this come in. Has Tonkwa been handled since he was very young or is he just a calm bird? Yes, so Tonkwa was actually um, uh, raised under human care. You may have noticed if you were paying really close attention to his leg, he's actually got a little um, bracelet. So that bracelet is actually his little ID bracelet. Um, he was born under human care and has been around people his entire life. And one of the ways that we keep him calm and interested in working with us is by using positive reinforcement with him. So we never force our animals to do anything we want. We just give them an, uh, um, a, a reason to want to come out and do things with us. So in Tonkawa's case today, Ryan had a big old pouch of treats on her belt and just for coming here with us and hanging out with us, he's getting some extra um, some extra treats. We call them reinforcers um, to reinforce that behavior of coming out. So by giving them something that they like, in Tonkawa's case, food, we give them uh, the uh, motivation to want to come out um, with us. They know that by hanging out with us, they're going to have a good time. They're going to get some extra things that they like. So yes, uh, we do a lot of training to make sure that our animals feel comfortable when they're out with us. And yes, he was born under human care. Great question. All right, it looks like that is our last question. We do have a reminder about the next event. All right, well, your next Earth Day Everyday Celebration is August 19th and the topic is water. So I'm that sounds really interesting to me. I'm sure you'll want to tune into that. But I do want to thank you all for tuning in to us today. Again, your support really does make a difference. We are a nonprofit here at the Dallas Zoo. So thank you for tuning in to us today. You're already helping us to create a better world for animals. Now, again, I mentioned we are still open seven days a week here at the zoo, and we're taking lots of precautions to make sure that your visit is a safe one. So if you are interested, we do have over 2,000 animals here at the Dallas Zoo that you can come and see, including some pretty exciting youngsters that have made their way into the zoo world recently. So uh, be sure to come and check us out, get those tickets online. But if you enjoyed this today and want to continue helping us to create a better world for animals, we hope to see you very soon here at your Dallas Zoo. Thank you all. All right. Thank you all so much for coming out. And um, the link for the next Earth Day Every Day is in the chat. Um, we also have um, on Monday, we'll have a plant identification 
Uh, so if you ever wanted to identify plants, not just animals, we have that coming up too. And I'll drop the link in that uh, chat as well for that. And thank you all so much. We really appreciate it.